to write it. It's like I literally just had a pen. Word in the cast. Okay, okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So a couple quick things. Um, one is that your first exam is due on Friday. Um, I will make this available today, the multiple choice part. Um, I just have to go through and like blackboard it. Blackboard has a process I have to go through, which is a little obnoxious. Um, but that'll be up by the end of the day today. The multiple choice part is actually written to do within 50 minutes. Um, so you could sit down and do it all in one chunk if you wanted. Again, remember all of this is open book, open note, just not open friend. Um, and so you'll have those multiple choice section. And then you will also have um, your essays, there really ended up be, end up being more short answers. Um, so basically you are going to answer each part of these. Um, so defining and researching personality, um, give your own definition, discuss the role of theory and methodology, and then how do the people we're studying differ than like lay people and how they talk about personality and then the second one is combining research assessment that we just finished talking about and then culture that we're going to start talking about today and you're going to take a concept and imagine you're going to come up with a way to assess it and so what would you want to measure and sort of why uh what kind of assessments explain that and we went over empirical keying, rational factor analysis. How would you construct it? Uh, we talked about this with one of our discussions. What type of data is it? Funder talks about this in a lot of detail. The S versus I versus L versus B data. And then thinking about the cultural considerations you'd want to take in to account. So I can't give you a page limit because some people write these really well in like two or three sentences. Some people write these really well in half a page, right? It just sort of depends on how verbose you personally are. Um, that being said, I can tell you I've had people turn these in and both answers were on a page and they did not have these fleshed out enough to get full points. Think about each of these as like five to 10 points. So think about what do I need to write to kind of explain enough to be a five point answer. And again, the other part is multiple choice. It's not timed. I'll get that up there today. I thought I already had it up there, but again, I got a blackboard in. The fun, the joy, the rapture of dealing with blackboard. Um, <laughs> any questions about the exam? Yeah. When is the class? There is, and there's no in-class portion. It's all take home. So you are doing, and I may have effed that up on the syllabus, so I apologize if it still says in-class. 
Once upon a time, the multiple choice was in class and the other part was take home. I just made it all take home. Um, whole bunch of reasons, but the biggest one is APA research shows that people who are first generation college students, people who are uh, not from high socioeconomic status, people who are people of color, other marginalized identities, do horrible on in class exams and that's like what 80 percent of wesleyan's population so why would i want to give you guys a test that you're going to do horrible on? <laughs> right? like, there's no justification for that so yeah i made them all take out now <laughs> very good question yeah would we be able to exit the multiple choice part and come back to that's that? a legitimate question i think so um i think there's a setting where i can do that so i'll make sure i check it Any other questions? And again, once I get it up, if you want to look at it and then come in with questions, we've got that. All righty. Well, what I'm going to do is dive into this culture and personality lecture. And one of the things that I want to make abundantly clear is that I cannot cover everything about culture and personality in this lecture. I literally teach a whole class just about the psychology of gender. Um, Dr. Martorell teaches a whole class just about cross-cultural psychology, right? So this is at least some description of what you're going to encounter and the important points. Um, if you notice, this is a very much a later chapter in your textbook. I pull it up front for a couple reasons. One is I think it's really important to give context to the rest of the semester as we talk about these things and how some theorists may not have considered this at all. Uh, and another is that a lot of times because this is at the end of the book, people don't get to it. And I think that's a crime. So I pull it up front to make sure we get to it. Um, yeah, so the idea of like culture can mean a whole bunch of different things, right? Is it like a subculture with your peer group? Right, where you might be a grown man, but dressing like a high schooler. Right, um, our goal is to diversify or to stress diversity while remaining a university. Right, so um, how are we getting at diversity? What does that mean? How does that play out? Alrighty. So we're gonna talk about what's culture. And so the definition is the psychological attributes of groups, including customs, habits, beliefs, and values. So the psychological attributes of groups, including customs, habits, beliefs, and values. And these are going to shape not only our emotions, but also our behaviors and our life patterns. So I'll say it one more time because it's very wordy. The psychological attributes of groups, including customs, habits, beliefs, and values. And these are going to shape emotions, behavior, and life patterns. They can include language, things like modes of thinking. Culture can also influence our fundamental view of reality. Things like how did the universe form, right? What is the way we interact with each other? There's a couple different things here. Um, enculturation. It's the process of socialization through which a person acquires their native culture. So the process of socialization through which an individual or person acquires their native culture. So this is the culture you're born into. This is the culture you exist in. Typically, enculturation happens pretty early in life. Right, and this is everything from watching what your parents do, attending uh, religious or other cultural festivities, um, how people dress, how people act, what jobs people have. 
Acculturation is the process of either partially or fully acquiring a new cultural outlook. So the process of partially or fully acquiring a new cultural outlook. So you move to a different country. Maybe they have a totally different way of dressing and acting and doing things. How much of that culture, that new culture do you take on? And sometimes people are doing this very consciously to try to fit in. So how do we compare cultures to one another? Well, we can look at things like how people behave, the experience of emotions, um, how people think about or conceptualize things, our sense of connection with each other and with the world. And so a lot of times when we're comparing cultures, we're looking for differences, but we also look at similarities. And I think that's really important and something people forget, right? We're all people, even if we come from different cultures. So there's often as many or more similarities as there are differences. All right, so emics are aspects that are specific to a particular culture. Aspects of a phenomenon that are specific to a particular culture. So my memory cue for emix is it's got an M in it, M, me, my culture. So specific to my culture or a particular culture. Edix or edix, I've heard it both ways, are aspects of a phenomenon that all cultures have in common. So an example here that the vast majority of human cultures use smiling as an expression of joy, right? That's an example of edicts. Um, aspects of a phenomenon that all cultures have in common. The memory cue I use here is if you kind of flip your T in edicts, it could look like an X, right? Or a plus sign. So cross culture or adding different cultures together. I don't know if you need these cues, but the way my brain works, I do. So I always figure if it works for me, I'll share it just in case it helps anybody else. So we know that there is some evolutionary aspect to these things, right? Otherwise, edicts wouldn't really be a thing, right? So we look at this in a couple different ways. One is called behavioral genetics. And this deals with the possibility that there are genes for individual differences in psychology. And we have some evidence for this. For example, there are genes we very closely have associated with depression. So behavioral genetics really gets at how do people differ and how do genetics explain those differences? Evolutionary psychology is aimed at genetic universals or those edicts. So what are the basic behavioral conditions of this species? When we're talking evolutionary psychology. Really interestingly, there are some stuff that makes a lot of sense in evolutionary psychology. One example, uh, Dr. Murrell teaches a whole class about this, if you're interested. Uh, one example that she gives is the fact that we're more afraid of like spiders and snakes than we are of guns, right? Like just statistically, how many people are killed by each thing? It would make way more sense for us to have that guttural reaction to a gun, right? But evolutionarily, back when we were like cave people, I don't know, plains people, right? Seeing a snake or a spider, could potentially mean death because there was no such thing as anti-venom, right? So that is part of it. There are some myths, however. So the idea that, you know, like there's this notion of progress inherent in evolution, basic evolutionary theory, that there's this great mysterious force that will always pull evolution upwards, get beings to be better. And the idea that life somehow becomes more complex 
And there are instances of things for sure that have developed complexity, but there are also instances of the same organisms then becoming simple again. One example is intestinal parasites. They are among the simplest of creatures and can wreak the most havoc on our bodies, right? Many older things haven't died out, such as bacteria. And bacteria have a greater weight than everything else living on this earth put together. Another example that's easier to visualize, crocodiles and alligators. They have not changed since the time of the dinosaurs. Jellies, where we used to call jelly fish, and now we fully acknowledge they're not fish, right? They're vertebrates. Have not changed since before the dinosaurs, right? So there are things that just don't change. This idea has been referenced in a movie called Idiocracy. Um, I used to show a clip from this, and it's just horrifically classist, so I don't show it anymore. Um, but the premise of this film is that they take people who are of average intelligence, they cryogenically freeze them, they're going to wake them up after a year, something goes horribly wrong, they wake up way in the future, and they're the smartest people on Earth. That essentially humans have devolved. Um, and so it's sort of like a, a way of poking fun at this. And there are elements of this that feel true sometimes in our society. Like I remember someone asking me about this once that I was like, there's this show that's like the most popular show in the idiocracy world. It's called Owl My Balls. And I'm like, well, you know, Wipeout is just all my, Owl My Balls, right? Like, <laughs> but there's also ways we're becoming more sophisticated, right? Um, evolution is slow and gradual is something that, you know, people say is a, a fundamental. This is sort of true, but not always. You can get small changes in genes that cause sudden large changes in organisms, but as we just talked about, things can be static and not change at all, especially if they've evolved optimally. There's also this idea that every trait is adaptive and thus has been selective for. You'll hear this phrase like survival of the fittest, right? Which is really interesting because Darwin never said that. It was his cousin Gallen who was actually a eugenicist. So maybe we shouldn't like put a lot of stock in what he said. I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, sometimes traits exist as correlated characteristics. So if you think about genes, right, and like strands of DNA, it's possible that there's genes next to each other and one gets selected for it, the other one just comes along for the ride, right? Like my piano teacher growing up used to be like, I don't know if we have pinky fingers other than do stuff other than play the piano. Like they're not actually that useful. And it's weird to think about, right? Or something like the appendix. Like, yes, it helps, but like you can take it out and most people are fine, right? And sometimes it just spontaneously tries to kill us, right? Like why do we still have an appendix? Um, and so sometimes we just have stuff that's not adaptive, that sticks around. And the characteristics we see functioning were selected for, for the function we see them, and really not always. And the most clear example of this is the human brain, right? What was it selected for? Well, we don't really know. We're trying to figure out, right? And we argue like hunter-gatherer situations, right? But there's so many things we do to at everything you all are doing right now, taking notes, looking at a screen, right? That like is the majority of what our brain does. And it certainly wasn't selected for that, but it's gotten good at that, right? So it's interesting to think about. Now in terms of behavior in evolutionary psychology, the human brain is a collection of evolved mechanism. This is the basic idea. The idea is that each mechanism within the brain is a solution to an adaptive problem. And that explains those edicts, those cross-cultural similarities in things like expressions, motor behavior, things like that. However, in this view, the brain is not a general process, just a computing system, just like beep, boop, take in, spit out, right? Um, and a hodgepodge of like rigid sets of behaviors. And we know that doesn't make sense considering what we can do now. Right? Like, why would the brain have evolved to be able to text or even to drive? Reproductive behavior and mating preferences, I would say, is like the biggest trendy thing when we're looking at evolutionary psych. There are some, particularly male, 
uh, evolutionary psychologists who love to talk about how everything in reproduction is just biologically based and essentially women should just fulfill their role and yeah just pop out babies right it's fine um so the standard idea is that women are biologically selected to mate wisely they want good mates so that uh they will come out with really good children and that men are biologically selected to mate widely like spread everything everywhere get as many um offspring as they can but as my grad professor, Dr. Newberry, told us, shouldn't the males go along with the program if they want to mate? Otherwise, then the males seem to be evolutionary inclined to act like jackasses. But if they want the females, they should just go along with it. And, and that's what we see, right? Is that like people who are in monogamous relationships, they're, you know, doing this mutually. Obviously, a lot of modern reproduction also doesn't fit this narrative right? So we think about single mothers, we think about people using IVF, right? We think about um, non-traditional families, LGBTQ plus families, right? Things along those lines. Birth control doesn't fit into this narrative. Why would we have invented birth control, right? If this was a, it was not a thing. Um, so if we're biologically driven to pass on our genes, then the availability of condoms or the pill shouldn't influence our behavior, but we know that it does. Even something like the rhythm method, if you're not familiar with that, that's like you try to figure out when the woman is ovulating and you don't have sex then, right? We wouldn't have figured that out if we just wanted to keep popping babies out, right? Take the one or two child policy in China, right? How would that fit into this idea? Or my favorite, take people's reactions to the Duggars. Right? Why would we kind of recoil from the idea of having 19 kids if like our whole programming is just to produce as many kids as we can, right? And so we seem to have moved away from pure genetic drive and that makes sense, right? Because we're evolved folks. Now in terms of culture and learning, uh, there's sort of a connection here, right? Certainly evolution and biology and genes are influencing things, but people figure stuff out for themselves and that's just as important. One of my professors in college told us genes are expressed in an environment. And that's one of the things I've always sort of like conceptualized things since. Yes, you have genes, but if you don't have the optimal environment for them to be expressed, they're not gonna come out. The silly example I use, although not that silly, right, is height. You could have the genes to be as tall as Shaq, right, Shaquille O'Neal. But if you're in an environment where you are nutritionally deprived, you are never gonna be that tall. You, and this could be bad too. You could have all the genes and all the propensity to develop depression, right? But if you never have really stressful life events and you have a really supportive community, you might never develop depression, right? So the two things interact together. So evolutionary psych has a way to go in order to prove there are all these universals and that these are only biologically driven. I mean, I just, the way I conceptualize things, it's, you know, we're not a blank slate. We're not all biologically programmed or something in between, right? Now, what about differences between cultures? Well, there's some early ideas about how do we start to conceptualize how cultures differ. So one of the first ones they talked about was tough versus easy. In easy cultures, individuals can uh, pursue many different goals, and at least some of those goals are going to be easy to obtain. In tough cultures, there are very few goals that are viewed as valuable and then very few ways to achieve them. So easy, you have choice to pursue whatever and some of those are really easy to get accomplished. And in tough, it's like there's only a certain few ways you can be successful and or you have to follow certain paths to get there. That was not surprisingly deemed too uh, simplistic. So we've evolved a little bit from there. 
you can look at just general stressfulness. And often the way we conceptualize that is we look at things like, what are the suicide rates? What are the homicide rates? Um, rates of you know brawls or viewing events as characterized by witchcraft rather than trying to find actual explanations. Um, so if you're not familiar, this is Grace Sherwood, the witch of Pongo. The statue is right next to Centera Independence on Witch Duck Road, uh, named for her. So she was a local legend. Uh, she was known as the Witch of Pongo to historians and locals. She was accused of bewitching a nature's, uh, neighbor's crop back in 1698. Um, and in 1706, they decided that she should be tested by ducking. If you're not familiar with ducking, you would bind the witch, drop her in the water. If she sank and drowned, she was innocent, but dead. Um, if she floated, she was a witch. And so uh, Grace Sherwood was dropped into the western branch of Linhaven River on what is now known as Witch Duck Point. They were ducking her. Uh, and she floated, so a sign of guilt. She was in prison for seven years, but eventually released. And she just lived the rest of her life quietly and died in 1740 at the age of 80, which was kind of like a big deal back then, right? Uh, one of my favorite things about Grace Sherwood is when Tim Kaine, who's now one of our senators, was governor in like the early 2000s. He pardoned her 300 years later. Um, but, you know, it's something that happened here, right? Who are we going to blame for what's going on? Sometimes people will talk about the emphasis on the need for achievement versus affiliation. In the U.S., we tend to see ourselves as achievement-oriented. We're the little engine that could. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Go, 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 right? In other cultures, it might be more focused on affiliation, needs for love and belongingness. Um, there's no clear causality in terms of which cultures are which here. One of the other things that we've looked at is complexity. This is one that's problematic. Um, it's very, I don't even know the word, racist, culturist, ethnocentric. Um, and so the idea here would be modern versus quote unquote simple cultures, but who gets to decide if a culture is simple, right? Um, and simple cultures that we would label as simple at any rate could have very complex systems. So for example, indigenous people in North America who might be labeled simple because they're not up to modern standards, they're, um, they had families, chiefs, alliances, various religions, various groups would interact in different ways, right? So even though it might be seen as, again, like the simple culture, they were pretty complex. Tightness, looseness is another one. And this is tolerance of deviation from acceptable behavior or what they sometimes call proper behavior. So tightness allows very little deviation from that proper behavior. And to enforce norms, uh, you'll have very similar people who live together and they live very close together. Now, um, looser cultures allow more flexibility. They tend to be more diverse and spread out. So some folks see the U.S. as loose because we do have diversity, but it really depends on where you live, right? And I can give you examples just if we think about it, like university cultures, right? So one of the colleges I visited was Oberlin College in Ohio. And if you're not familiar, it is probably the most liberal liberal arts college. Like back in the 2000s, they had gender neutral bathrooms in the dorms. Like that's just how they roll. Right. Um, whereas some place like Bob Jones University, where like they have very strict rules and they have like um, curfews for their folks when they have to be back in the dorms and like people of the opposite gender can't be in your dorm. And like at one point, women had to wear like ankle length skirts and things like that. Right. So those are both existing within the US and they're not that geographically distant. Right. 
but to very different experiences. So the one that we tend to focus on now is collectivism versus individualism. So this is a view of the relationship between the individual and society at large. So the individual and society. And it looks at the importance of needs and rights of the group versus the importance of the needs and rights of the individual. How clear is the boundary between the individual and the group? Give you an example of this. So um, my father is retired now, but he worked in the auto industry and he would often travel to places like Japan, South Korea, China uh, for work, Brazil, lots of different places. And one time when he was in Japan, he and one other member of the team in Japan worked together basically like all night on a presentation. When they gave it the next day, my dad thanked the gentleman and he was horrifically embarrassed and pulled my dad aside afterwards and said, we don't do that here. My work is a reflection of the team. We don't call people out individually. And to my dad from a very individualistic culture here in the US, it's sort of mind boggling, right? But that's how they conceptualize things. The meaning of personality might even differ between these cultures. The personality is more meaningful. We've done, there's been studies done, there's actually more words to describe personality in individualistic cultures. This doesn't mean that personality has no meaning in collectivist cultures. We see that personality can predict behavior and is consistent across situations in both types of cultures. Another really interesting thing is that what are the predictors for satisfaction with life in those cultures? Is it self-esteem, like we see in individualistic cultures? Or is it harmony of your relationships with others, like we see in collectivist cultures? People from individualistic cultures are more prone to loneliness and depression. Uh, and we see this if we look at rates in, say, like the United States versus India or China. Another thing that comes into play is, is your preference for doing activities in a group or alone. Often when I assign group projects here, people groan, right? <laughs> Whereas in collectivist cultures, they may be really excited. Um, how you experience emotions. Are your emotions other focused? Things like sympathy, or are they more self-focused? Things like anger. This can also relate to things like the importance of love in marriages. So for example, arranged marriages are more common in collectivist cultures. And then wh what do you depend on for your social work? Is it how you interact with your people around you? Or is it how you portray yourself individually? Now, in terms of the fundamental motivations, collectivist cultures focus more on avoiding loss of respect. You'll hear this in some cultures, they'll talk about um, saving face. This is extremely important in some cultures. Because respect by others can be easily lost and can be difficult to regain. Individualistic cultures focus more on achievement of enjoyment, pleasure, reward, and that can lead to self-enhancement in these cultures. Now, because this has been around for a while, some people have taken and tried to expand upon this. So there's a second dimension of a vertical versus horizontal. Vertical cultures assume individuals are different in important ways. And horizontal cultures view individuals as essentially equal. And now what's really interesting is I think a lot of people think the US is horizontal and we believe in the equality of everybody. But I think we're vertical in a lot of ways. People tend to like sort of venerate the super rich. Again, just the fact that like, the Kardashians have their show and their success, right? Kind of lends itself to this idea. Similarly, 
collectivist cultures can also be vertical. We think of cultures like India, where they have the strict caste system, for example. Another dimension they look at is something like self-compassion, which is holding painful emotions in mindful awareness while feelings of care and kindness are extended to the self. So the fancy definition essentially is like, can you be kind to yourself? Um, they're trying to study this a lot in my subfield, actually, and people who are self-compassionate, maybe not surprisingly, are less likely to engage in destructive, disordered eating behaviors. Um, but there's been a study that looked at this in Taiwan, Thailand, and the U.S. They found the highest levels of self-compassion in Thailand, where Buddhism is the main religion. And the lowest levels were actually in Taiwan, where Confucianism is the main religious belief. Confucianism says humans are teachable, improvable, and perfectionable. Um, the main idea of Confucianism is the cultivation of virtue and the development of moral perfection. Confucianism holds that one should give up one's life if necessary, either passively or actively, for the sake of upholding the cardinal moral values. So not so self-compassionate, right? Uh, and the U.S. was in the middle of two leftivist cultures. And one thing that's really important to emphasize is that like, this is not blanket, right? Everyone within that culture. So some people within collectivist cultures might be more individualistic. There are certainly subcultures within the US that are more uh, uh, collectivistic, particularly um, indigenous folks, folks from certain Asian American backgrounds, folks from Latinx culture, Latina, Latino, um, they tend to be more collectivist. One of the ideas that people have thrown out is, do people have different traits in collectivist cultures than individualistic cultures? We're gonna talk about what the big five is uh, here quite a lot this semester. And those of you who were able to be here on Friday had the chance to fill out a big five questionnaire. And we have found these personality traits in observer ratings in over 50 cultures. Um, and these are, grab my shop here. The, the easy way to remember the big five is ocean. So openness, and it's openness to experience, but I'll just write openness. Conscientiousness, okay, not consciousness, conscientiousness. <laughs> um, so openness to experience is being willing to learn new things right? Find out new things. Conscientiousness is being on top of things. I have an obligation to do this for someone, or I owe it to myself to do things. Um, extroversion. Being outgoing. Social. Then there's agreeableness. How long do you, how long, how well do you get along with other people? And the last one is the only like negatively valenced one and that's neuroticism. Neuroticism is an old word that essentially means um, internalizing mental issues. So anxiety, depression, things like that fall under neuroticism. We do find variations in these traits, as so one or more of these might differ from culture to culture. Also, within cultures sometimes. But research shows that of these big fives, it is conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness. So these three middle ones that seem to be more universal. We find those over and over and over. One of the problems is difficulties of translations, right? So if we think about what we just talked about, where collective cultures might not even have the same number of words for personality traits, right? How do we make sure we're conveying the exact same thing in their language? 
There are also factors other than the big five that pop up. You see them here on the screen. Things like unselfishness, gentle temper, uh, dependency or fragility, uh, positive valence or versus negative valence. That would be like positive versus negative emotionality, pleasantness, engagement, interpersonal relatedness. You could certainly imagine being really important in like a collectivist culture. One of the things that is culturally related as well is sex differences. So we're going to talk about those as well. So there was research into sex differences pre-1973. Um, in fact, one of the first women to ever get a PhD in psychology, that's what she studied around the turn of the, uh, turn of the 19th century in the 1900s. Um, but it was often only women who were studying it because they were the ones who cared about it, right? They were the ones who were like, no, there are differences in how we're treated, right? In 1974, a book was published called The Psychology of Sex Differences. And this book made some really broad conclusions. It said that women have better verbal ability than men. Men have more mathematical and spatial ability than women. Men were more aggressive than women. And that there wasn't enough research to examine any other differences. Now, one thing that was really interesting is they published this whole book about this, right? But the differences that did exist were really small. Um, and But it did spark a lot more research. So one of the things that happened as a result of this is journals started to require that if your sample included both men and women, you talk about whether there were any sex differences. This meant that women were included more in studies. Prior to this, the vast majority of studies, not only psychologically, but also medically, have been done on men. A whole bunch of different reasons, a lot of them really silly. Well, women have all these hormone cycles, so they can't be a baseline. Okay, but that's half your population. Don't you want to know what's happening, right? Um, and so in 1992, the federal government said, if we're going to give you funding to do research, you have to study both sexes. Again, at that time, we'll, hopefully we'll evolve to all, right? Um, unless the research in question was gender specific. So for example, within my subfield, a lot of times you'll see studies on men versus studies on women on eating disorders pulled out separately, simply because there are some different risk factors. But that was huge, right? Before that, again, the vast majority of studies could just be all male. So here's some example of differences. Um, so the opposite essentially of agreeableness is aggressiveness uh and what they found is that men have more physical aggression than women effect sizes are pretty high for this however uh sorry then then they also it's men also are scarring high on if they're imagining physical aggression for somebody else um, and this has a large effect on daily life. We know that more men than women commit violent crime, for example. We also know that men are more likely to die by suicide, even though women are more likely to attempt, because men choose more lethal means. But what about other forms of aggression, right? Relational aggression is a huge one. And if you don't know what relational aggression is, it's the movie or play. Mean girls, okay? It's the backstabbing, it's the spreading rumors about people, uh, it's the sabotaging other women typically. Um, so women will spread rumors and rather than physically attacking someone. Um, and women show this much more than men, partially because it's socially accepted, right? We do see a increase in violent crimes among women. Um, and this suggests that these sex differences in aggression may be due in part to socialization, right? Whether uh, it's considered acceptable. One of the things I thought was really interesting this summer 
um, when the boxer from Algeria, who's intersex, right, but has been cleared to compete as a female, that's how she identifies, that's how her external genitalia look. When that argument came up, a lot of people were like, oh, we shouldn't be letting that. People misjudged, said she was trans, but she's not. Um, and, but then some people were like, well, why are we even having women box? Why are women competing in this physical sport? Um, and it's BS, right? Because women want to do any sport that men do, right? And so um, there's this idea about social acceptability still of what women are allowed to do that's feminine enough, which is a little absurd in the year of our Lord 2024, right? So why are cultures different, right? Why do we see this? What determines the specific distinctive psychology that a particular culture develops? Well, one of the things you'll see is that some theorists will just try to avoid this issue. They'll like sidestep it. And they'll talk about deconstructionism. Reality has no meaning apart from what humans invent or construct or put on something. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, that doesn't actually explain anything, right? So um, this is really not a useful approach. Instead, what we tend to do is look at the ecological approach. And these, this is the view that differences exist because cultures developed in different circumstances and with the need to deal with different problems. And this can include their physical environment. So your ecology, where you live, the physical layout and resources of your land, and the distinctive tasks and challenges are going to influence your culture, how you socialize, that's going to influence your personality, which in turn will influence how you behave. So for example, in China, they needed really complex agricultural projects like irrigation systems uh, and water systems. And that required a lot of coordination. And some people have suggested things like that resulted in the collectivism that's more common there. Whereas in some place like Germany, there was much more wooded land. And so they needed to hunt and hunting could be a much more individual effort. Uh, and these are only speculations, right? No one has yet invented a time machine so we can go back and like interview these people, <laughs> right? Do studies with them. But we're trying to figure stuff out. And socialization here, I should say, is both explicit, what you're taught, right? What you're, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. But then also what you kind of see people around you doing, implicit. So cultural differences might also come from personality differences. It could go the other way, essentially. Genetics may affect both personality and culture, but as we talked about before, genetic differences may be small at best. Um, traits are likely to be weak predictors of behavior at that larger cultural level. They work really well for an individual person. When you diffuse them, it's not great. People within cultures also differ from each other. And the data that the support this idea that it's like all from genetics can actually be explained in a host of other ways. So one of the things that we want to fight against here is ethnocentrism, which is judging other cultures from our point of view. This is something psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists have been very guilty of in the past. Um, well, everything is inferior to Western culture, right? So observations of other cultures we know will be influenced by our own cultural background but we've got to kind of check ourselves on this. The exaggeration of cultural differences is often based on assuming all individuals of a culture are alike. And the focus of research has been on differences for both gender and cross-cultural research. They have often really large sample sizes. We know that sometimes with large sample sizes, you see statistically significant results, even when you have very small 
not clinically significant findings. There's something called outgroup homogeneity bias, where we tend to see members of groups that we don't belong to as more similar than we are to the people of our group. And in fact, cultures themselves are often more similar than they are different. So we know that it can be really difficult to define culture itself. And we also know that really important subcultures or subgroups exist within larger cultures. And people can belong to more than one culture. So bicultural identity integration is where people who are from more than one culture see the world in themselves, including their own personality through more than one cultural lens. Sometimes they try to integrate the culture. Sometimes it's a continuum as to how much they buy into each culture, but this exists. All right, last slide, I got through. All right. So there's a new emphasis now in psychology of looking at how people are psychologically similar. And we tend to feel emotions very much similarly. Uh, the desire to please your parents, pretty universal. <laughs> uh, personal goals, having them, it's also pretty universal. Awesome. Okay, so on Wednesday, we're going to do a discussion day. Um, so we'll be all set for that. Thank <sighs> you.